So we're going to do a little bit of review. We're in the book of Romans, so if you want to go ahead, get you a Bible, open up to Romans. Pop open to chapter 6. We're going to do a little review on that. So now, as the apostles started this letter out in introducing the idea that this is a theological or a religious type of principles that he's going to give, it's, it's almost um, a way that Paul is trying to express the totality of God's thinking when it comes to uh, the sin problem, how he planned it, how you can be right with God, and then how we maintain that relationship, and then a practical application at the end of it, and he gets a little more practical. But it gets a little base at the beginning when he first says the, the gospel. It's only the gospel that can save. There's nothing else that can save. And then he talks about how that everybody has sinned, regardless. It doesn't matter. We have all fallen short of the glory. That the Gentiles, even before... Christianity came, that we see that the Gentiles had debased their minds, had walked away from God, started worshiping materialistic things and idols, and, and so God gave them up. And in doing so, they debased their minds even more, became more depraved, and then he says God will bring a judgment to them. But then he turns and he talks about those who believe they were religiously correct with God, the Jews. And he tells them, says, look, you had the law, you had righteous moral values, and you had the ability to teach that and express it and illuminate the world with those standards. But what did you do with it? You preached it, but you didn't do it. And so you were wrong too. You couldn't keep it. Now what does that do? That helps us to remind ourselves that there's none of us that are any better than anybody else. That we are all broken. There's nothing that you or I can do on our own to ever be right with God. I can do all the things in the world you know, wonderful, wonderful things, but it's never going to make up for the fact that I am a broken spiritual sinner. I need something more powerful. So he then talks about how God brought this to being. So he starts out by identifying that one, we were helpless, and then in three, he starts talking about how that he brought in the solution. That when we were unable to take care of, rescue ourselves, that he brought in his son. And we were enemies of his. We were his adversary. But he did it anyway because of his love for us. And that the way that a person is found correct before God, that you could approach God comfortably, not like that friend of yours you had a big fight with and you have to show up at dinner with him and you're sitting there looking across the table from him and you feel very awkward because you've had bad words, you're not comfortable. You know, that's something, and I know I'm kind of oversimplifying that a little bit maybe, but we've had those awkward moments where you've had something between someone else, and when you get in their presence, you don't feel very comfortable. But he says we can have that comfort, comfort by coming into God's presence because of his son, because of the blood. But it, it's not because of yourself. It's not because of the law of Moses. law of Moses did nothing to help you really be righteous in of itself. It taught a standard. It gave an example to look at and say, this is a standard. But law could not save you at all. Law just came in and, and condemned you. Now, when we use that word law, I want us to keep bringing this up because it's so important to understand. He's dealing with Moses' law. He's dealing with really a universal moral principle. He talked about that in the beginning of it, but he doesn't call it out specifically by a, a definition. But it's implied because when he can, God says that where there is no sin, there's no, there's, where there's no law, there's no sin. You know, if you, you know, it's the way our country's built this too. If there's no law against it, you can't be a lawbreaker to something that does not exist. But we know he's already shown that the Gentiles were condemned. There's, there was a principles, moral principles that they had violated that was a sense, a law, a standard. So there's always that. That whether you were a Jew or not, there was something that was putting us in a condemned state. It was when Christ came that everything was reconciled through Him. No longer was there anything else. It was going to be through Christ's blood that was going to save us. And what was really making God pleased and what really created that pleased relationship with Him was faith. And He kind of reminds the Jew that, look, let's go back to your father Abraham, and how was he found pleasing? Because he obeyed Mosaic law? No, because it didn't exist. Was he found right before God, before he was circumcised? 
No, he was pleased before circum. I'm sorry, he was pleased before circumcised ever even existed. So, it's faith. What justified Abraham? And that is what caused it. Now, faith is not action. It has actions to it. It's not something that you just passively absorb and believe. If somebody tells you something and tells you how to fix a problem and you just sit back and say, well, okay, I kind of believe, but you never do anything with that information, then it's dead. It has no power at all. So when God called Abraham, he listened, and that was faith, and he took action and he did what God said. That's how we do it. So regardless of what God is telling you, whether it's under the Mosaic Law, whether it's the universal moral law that the Gentiles were using, faith is what justifies us before God. Faith will also direct us in the fulfillment of that, showing our faith accomplish what God is speaking to us about. So law and all of this external uh, standards expose something. And I say external moral standards in the sense that, you know, what God has put within us, that we know what is morally right from wrong, that evolutionists struggle with the idea of why do we have moral values because those are not something that an animal evolves with. C.S. Lewis also brings up the fact, one of the things that got him to believing into God was the fact that moral values was a problem. How did we develop moral values? Where did they come from? And there, no matter where you go, even an atheist is going to get mad if you cut him off the road or if you go stand in line and take shortcuts because he's going to say, that's wrong. Well, where do you get your right and wrong from? What gives you the right to determine what's right or wrong? If there's no God, there's no moral standard, then I can determine what I think is right and I don't care what you think. I think it's okay for me to take from you. So that, that alone is something that is a standard that condemns or supports what we're doing. It's an internal part of a law that God has placed within us. But that still creates a problem until we sear our conscience to the point where we will no longer listen to it, but it bothers us. It's inside us. You see it when you first become a Christian as you're starting to make that, that journey to salvation. You see what's going on with it. And so we glorify in the fact that now we're set free from the law of Moses. We're, we're, we have this great freedom that nobody's ever had before. So does that mean that when I'm sinning as a Christian, I'm making God look better? And that's where we come into chapter 6 when it's like kind of this idea, well, okay, I am saved, I'm justified, I've got this blood that protects me, and so now I can go ahead and when I sin, it's all right because it kind of makes God's righteousness even better. And I know that sounds silly, but that is kind of an illogical approach that some have taken to this. And so Paul says, absolutely not. You've got to understand there's a deeper relationship that every one of us have with sin. And it goes back to Adam and Eve. And that's where he goes, and he's already ended chapter 5 with that idea that there were these two men, Adam, the beginning of man, not just Adam male, but mankind, brought sin in and it caused death. It also brought forward, and we're going to talk about that tonight, so this is kind of an important part, is that it also exposed law and brought it to life. Now you think there was, you think about it, there was no sin before the transgression in the garden. There's no sin. So there's no need for any problem. There was, it was in a, you never thought about law. They didn't think about those things. They didn't think about coveting. There was nothing. There was no sin. So it didn't condemn them. But once sin came in, it just not only separated them from the tree of life, which eventually physically they would die, but spiritually sin started to do, rise up. And through the population, and as the people grew, more and more sin, more and more unrighteousness, and it just multiplied to the point where we get to uh, Genesis 6, where God says, okay, I am, I am sad. I, I am regretting that I created man, and God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon them. Now, if there was nothing legislated or legally wrong with their behavior, God could not bring a judgment on them. A judgment has to be something in which they have violated a standard. So we know that there was a moral law there that God said, I'm done with this. And so God then wipes out the earth. But sin didn't stop, did it? We find right away that it just continued and continued to multiply. And then we find Mosaic Law comes along and it's very specific and it very well defines what God, the one creator God, says is the standard for living right before Him. 
But that's all it did. It did not save him. And it had this process of animals and sacrifice and all those things. And so now that still was not the standard God was shooting for. He knew what was coming. It was going to be his son, Jesus Christ. So he, he then shows that death was brought in by Adam, the first one, and Paul at the end of five then talks about how that there was another one that came, another Adam, who was Jesus Christ. And he brought life. One man brought in this condemnation. Another man brought in salvation. And so just because now that the old one's done and we're set free, sin has got to still go away. You, can't under, you cannot continue in that path and justify it. So then in chapter 6, he then develops the idea of the relationship between sin and what it has with us. And he uses the concept in the last part of 6 with slavery, being bound to something. But he first starts by initiating it by saying, understand that there was a process through baptism that created a death, burial, and resurrection like our Lord Jesus Christ. Which then, once we have come up through that watery grave, we are now new. We are a new creature. We have been set free from that old relationship. Now, it doesn't mean it's a perfect life. It doesn't mean that you're sin-free. It's just that now you have a new relationship with it. And we really kind of covered that pretty good in this morning's class in Hebrews as well. So, as he comes into now this idea of bondage or who you're serving, there are two types. There's darkness and there's light. There's sin and there's righteousness. And we have to understand that we are no longer bound to listening or obeying sin. Sin is something that has raged raged against us, has created us a bondage sense, and held us captive. Now, just because now we're set free from that slavery does not mean that now that we are slaves to Christ and righteousness, that we're going to be perfected. It's not. He's developing an overall idea of our relationship. These chapters become very important to understanding how we can be so confident in our relationship with God. And it's not going to be because you're able to just conquer all your sin in your life, but it's an understanding of what makes you right with God. So we now have this service, this slavery towards serving. Use everything you have, your hands, your eyes, your heart, your thoughts to bringing forth good works. Do not allow sin to reign, to be any of the energy that your body has to serving ungodliness. And when we do fail, we know we go and repent. We ask forgiveness. But he's talking about the bigger picture. So when he comes to seven, he's going to also explain, and he kind of points to the Jews and talks about those who understand the Mosaic Law. But there's three points in this lesson we're going to look at that he tries to illustrate our relationship. It's almost like there's two people within us. There are two parts to us. There's a part that that understands, you know, that there's a problem with sin and we argue with sin and we try to rebel against it and we're sensitive to it and we want to stop it. And then there's this other side within us that just wants it. And when when we do it, you know, and then we catch ourselves and we go... Ah, oh, what a horrible person I am. And we're, we're in that dilemma, that internal battle that Paul will get into toward the end of this chapter. But before he does that, he explains the different relationship that we have. It's not the same. Just because you sin doesn't all of a sudden mean you're automatically removed and you're back into the slavery of sin. You're still dedicated to Christ. So he uses this example of marriage and the relationship between spouses and law. And I know a lot of people use it for other things, but we'll just go through this anyway without that. And the next one is how sin has taken advantage in a sense and exposed the weakness within us and has used those universal principles of law against us and what it does to us. And it's kind of interesting because Paul's going to change the way he speaks, and it's going to be kind of in, in first person, but not him. And sometimes people read this chapter and believe that it, that's Paul. Paul is talking about his own personal experience and internal fight. I don't think it is, but it's not a problem if you believe that. It does kind of fit. I think he's using a general principle for all people. 
and the, the relationship that we have with it. And then that's the last part where he has that very uh, well-known argument with himself about that battle, about the problem of what sin is within us. And we're never going to completely remove that problem until we finally join the Lord in heaven. So the first thing he does, he starts out by talking about the relationship to two individuals that they have legally with one another, a male and a female. So let's read one through three. Uh, since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, do, not, do you not know that the law rules over somebody as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while she lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then, if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. So, he's talking now really more specifically to the Hebrews who are still feeling like they're bound to the Mosaic law. That this is a relationship in which how do you get away from that? And then, so he's, what he's talking about in a sense is that the death of the first covenant is gone. You understand that while it, they both exist, but one of them has died. The old has died. And in the marriage relationship, they understood very simply that if two people were married, that they were bound together. If one was to depart and go re-engage in a marriage with somebody else, that person would be an adulteress. But if the person died, the spouse of either one of them died, then there is no bound, there's nothing to be bound to in that relationship. It's dissolved and gone. You long, no longer have that spouse as a husband or a wife. So you're free. So the old is done. It's completed. It's done away with. And so now in 4 and 6, he says, Therefore, looking at that change in bondage or relationship, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you were also put to death in relationship to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passion aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit of death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to that which held, what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. So, as he talks about this, he says this illustration should really clear up and show you that this has changed. And that now, like he's already talked about in 6, the continuation of this death, burial, resurrection, new relationship that we have with him. So we've been released from that, and now we are serving in a newness of life. So it's still holding the same thoughts as he goes through this and not changing it. So now, how does sin and law come in? How do they work together and what does it do and the effect and impact that it has on our lives is what's important when we see this. So let's look at 7 through 11. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. But I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, the sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came in, it sprang to life, uh, sin sprang to life again, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And, though, and through it killed me, though it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Therefore, did what is good become death to me? Absolutely not. But sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond all measure. So, Law is still good. Law has established what is sin. The law is not sin. It's like saying our criminal justice law that we have 
is sinful. It's, it's criminal itself. <laughs> it's not. All it does is explain it and it allows us to understand it. Now, there's a lot of people, you know, I mean, there's laws that you probably were unaware of and you don't go around thinking about. I don't think anybody understands all the laws in our country. There's probably a lot of civil laws that you're unaware of. And so it doesn't bother you. But there are probably some laws, like I know, for example, kind of a little silly or maybe too simple, but there was a speed zone where I used to drive through all the time, and I had such a habit of going the wrong speed. I would speed through it. Never knew that that speed was reduced by 15 miles an hour until the cop pulled me over and told me, you, that is a, that, that's a, you're speeding in this zone. And it was a little short distance. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? I've been living and driving through this area for 15, 20 years. He goes, it's always been that way. And it never bothered me. Never bothered me. I'd get in my car and drive through that little section of road and always and sin. And it didn't bother me. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. But then all of a sudden, from that point on, every time I approach that little strip of road, it's on Valley Drive, you know, that where I should know better, it gets me. <laughs> and you know what? I still speed through it a lot of times. And I catch myself. And it bothers me. And now it's really a pest because now that I have a knowledge about it, I know that I'm breaking the law. Before I knew that, pfft, it didn't bother me. I had no idea what it meant. Yeah. If that cop would have never pulled me over and told me that that was illegal, I'd have been happy. Did it make it right? No. It still would have been breaking the law. But there's a reason that that zone changes. Why the speed limit is still that speed at that area. And it's for a good reason. I don't agree with the reason but it's not my, just, my ability to determine what is just or not. But the law does that. And so that's a part, maybe, I hope maybe that will help understand when we look at what sin did. When he talks about coveting, coveting didn't bother him until it became a problem with the law. When the law stepped in and said, hey, coveting's wrong, you can't do that. Man, I was coveting everything. It wasn't like all of a sudden, because it became illegal, he wanted to covet more. It's because he started looking around at the things in which he had been doing wrong to begin with, never had a conscience about it. Now it's crawling on him because he realizes, I was coveting here, I was coveting in that, and when I was thinking this, I was coveting, and man, coveting was just all over now because the law taught him. And, all, and then what do you do with that? Because now you feel worse. But you're not any better with God. Coveting was always wrong. Just because I didn't know the speed limit wasn't the speed limit and I didn't know it didn't make me right. So we're still, we're still bound to know what it is. So law was good, holy, beautiful. It brought all that out and taught me something. But when sin sprang to life, I die spiritually. And that's a problem that I have to deal with. And the life... It should have, law should have been saving me. Not speeding through there and hurting somebody or doing things like that. The very law, it actually caused me to be a criminal. Is it the law's fault? No. Of course not, right? You'd say, no. So it's, where's the fault? Now that's where when he uses this word, it, it sees an opportunity. It's almost like it got personal. It's like, you know, it, it stepped up and just took advantage of me. And so I think he's, he's kind of expressing our sentiment, the way that we feel about what it has done to us when we start identifying righteous standards and when we start breaking them and how it comes at us. And we're looking at it like, man, now it's all over me. Everything I do, I start to see that I am so broke. The sin is just eating me up. And so he asks, he says, therefore, in 13, he says, therefore, did what is good become death to me? Because that's what it seems like. I mean, just increase the speed limit to what I want, and then I'm okay. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a lawbreaker. Just take coveting away, and I won't be dead to sin. I won't have sin, right? No. Because sin makes me a sinner. 
get rid of it. Just don't call it that. And then I'm not, no, you can't do that. That's the whole problem with man justifying what they want anyway. And so he said, absolutely not. But sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good. What is good was showing me what is bad, what was destroying me. And it helps me, humbles me, teaches me, corrects me, and helps me to be right with God because I can identify what's happening to me. And so sin becomes even uglier. When you start to learn what the impact of coveting is, lust, coveting, all those things that the law describes as wrong, when you start seeing the impact of it, you're going to get caught up in it, but it's also going to see more and more effects of all those out there around you that are doing these things. And so it's a teaching. So where's the problem then? Well, it's inside us, isn't it? We have something that we're battling, that we're dealing with. So 14 through 25 now then deals with this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold as a slave under sin. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do. But I do what I hate. Now, If I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is within me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do good that I want to do but I practice the evil that I do not want. So let's just unpack just this part. This is an internal battle that he's talking about as we look at this. He says, we know that the law is spiritual. And because of that, when we break it, we're bound. And then we start to have that conversation with ourselves about, I have this standard of what God wants, and I want to do that. I really do. But I don't. (laughs) I seem to keep doing the very thing that I hate. And then I turn around and I go, this is the good side. This is what I want to do. This is the behavior I want. And he says that very logical conversation does what? It declares the law is good. It doesn't make me feel any better just because my badness is making righteousness stand out and that I'm supporting the level of righteousness God wants, I still seem to have this internal battle that I cannot seem to conquer. And he says, that, and when he says there's nothing good that lives within me is this idea of many of us, have, we've had it, where there's times where we look within ourselves, we look in the mirror and we think, there's nothing good about me. It just seems like everything I am about, honestly, I just am a failure. If you haven't had that and just talking to yourself in life, but when you look spiritually, it really becomes a difficult conversation that we seem to hold and keep talking to ourselves about. We have a desire to do good, but we seem to not do it. And so we're in this kind of a trap. So now in 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it. But... It is a sin that lives in me. So I discovered this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law working in my inner body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, he's not saying he has no self-control. It sounds like it. You know, there in verse 20, now then, if I, <laughs> if I do what I don't want to do, it's hands off. Okay, it's not me. No, he's talking about really this living in this failure of self-control that's going to happen, that seems to always happen. 
And it's sin that seems to come up. Why? Because the law taught me. Sin is not law. Law is law. Law describes an action that it becomes criminal or sinful. So when he's talking about the law, the sin is us inside the battle. We know what the law is, the standard, but we break it. No matter how insignificant of the law is, whether it's two miles over the speed limit or 25, doesn't matter. You can argue it all day long. I was only doing a mile over. It's breaking the law. The speed limit was 35, not 36, not 35.5, 35. So whether you're doing 135 mile an hour zone or just half a mile, it's still, you're breaking it. And most people that are sincere, that are having this conversation, have a heart that's truly seeking God anyway. And this is what we fight within ourselves as a Christian, trying to understand this. So who's going, to re- who's going to rescue us? He sees himself as a wretched man, one that has this battle within. This ties with the whole letter in the equality of how we are all broke before God, how God is the one who has brought us into the proper relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that we are now new creatures, not perfect new creatures, but new creatures creatures with a new life with a new relationship to this world and the law of christ the gospel the principal moral standards that god has put in us that we learn from helps us one it aggravates us because it keeps telling me how broke i am because i can't seem to achieve it but that you causes us to be humble and realize what do i do you can't save me i can't save myself there's nobody on this earth And that's when Paul cries out, Thank you, God, for Jesus Christ. Thank you. Because it's only in Jesus Christ that we can have that salvation. We're going to continue this and keep going. These are really important chapters, especially when we get to 8 as well and move on. I hope you'll continue to look at this because I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful way for us to try to deal with the internal battles that we're having. And understand that you're not going to be able to conquer it. Sin is going to be this battle we will continue to have. But how do you deal with it? One, understand the battle's real. Understand that being in Christ is not perfect perfection. And that you have to cope and deal with when you do sin. One, don't quit. <laughs> don't give up on yourself. God hasn't. God set a plan of salvation to act into, into motion and is in effect to this day to where it will not give up on us. As much as we turn to Him, He will always be ready to receive us into His loving arms. But I have to make that call. And I have to work out that death that seems to want to just keep killing me spiritually. And when I do stumble and fall, I've got to stand up. I've got to first take a spiritual knee pray and ask for forgiveness with a heart that really wants to change. And then He will always forgive me. That's what makes us righteous before God and keeps us there until we stop being sensitized to that inner battle. We quit listening to it. It quits bothering us. We quit going to God and asking for forgiveness. We will always have access, but we have to look at that. So let's think about these things while we sing this.